everybody, welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today we are going to be talking about the art of opening in the moment, um, couples connections, which I think is so critical right now during the holiday season when we're getting together with relatives, which seems to be a supercharged event. At least it has been for me in the past and I think for a lot of couples. Um, we have Catherine Ford here um, today who is going to be talking about how we can relate to our loved ones. And I think generally by using some of the um, techniques that she uses um, in her own practice. So welcome, Catherine. Hi, CJ. Thanks for having me. So tell me a little bit about how all how this body of work came together. Yeah, I think it came together through um, the juxtaposition of two different things that I was studying. Um, I went to Stanford for my residency in psychiatry, where I got, um, Stanford is well known for kind of an eclectic approach. So I got a lot of training in psychology, in the typical approaches of psychiatry, which very often emphasizes the same things that I find the couple sometimes emphasize, which is understanding something from the point of view of a model or, or, or figuring things out. But simultaneously, I also, um, my residency was at Stanford in California, so I also got very interested in meditation. And as I began to study meditation, um, I, you know, became more and more interested in what meditation has to offer in terms of helping us learn how to pay attention just to what's happening without interpretation, without explanation, without figuring it out, just the raw experience of this is where we are. I should also say Say that when I thought about it, there was one particular place in my training where that kind of attention was emphasized. Um, when I was at Stanford, Irv Yalom was there teaching all kinds of things, but especially he ran um, uh, therapy groups. And Irv's way of running a therapy group is quite different than anybody else's. His main emphasis for himself, for the residents who were in training with him, and for the people in the group was pay attention to what's happening right here in the room as we talk to each other. Mm. And so when I thought about, well, how did I learn, how did I come to this way of working with couples? I think Irv also had a great deal of influence there in terms of getting me interested in and teaching me how to work with what's really observable as opposed to these, what I think of as secondary elaborations. And so that's really um, how I came to How I came to couples is I just think that being a couple is one of the most interesting things in the world. And then of course, being interested in couples and studying them as I, as I help them with their problems made me interested in general in our relationships and what makes them work and what gets in the way of making them work so okay so i don't know where in your practice you started introducing some of these techniques that you're offering in the book but um can you share with me um some of the th shifts that you've seen with couples working with each other kind of like a before and after look at what happened when they were using some of the practices that you talk about in the book yeah so what I think of it this way, most of the people that I work with are very loving people. They're very well intentioned. Um, a couple that comes into a couple's therapist by and large really want this to work. They want to be with each other. They want to understand each other. And when we're talking to somebody that's important to us, I mean, think about that's what we want. We want to be heard and understood. Before working with what I call aperture, which, which is basically a word to describe, are we open to each other or not? Uh, what I would see is um, things would get difficult in a conversation and maybe one person would kind of go up in their head and they would start telling the other person, well, I know that, I know that that's what you think because that's what your mother thought and you're just like her or I know that's what you think because you have, you know, a dominant personality style. And so, of course, you would relate that way. And as she did that, I would notice that she would lose touch with what was actually happening in the room. And so would her partner. Mm. Or conversely, a very different style, I might see somebody trying very hard to communicate, it's getting difficult. And because it's getting so difficult, and they can't figure out what to do, they just shut down and they stop paying attention. And they mm. basically numb out. 
Um, and all of us probably know something about that state. We do it in various moments to kind of decrease the level of um, stimulation and frustration. But of course, from the numbed out, checking out place, you can't really do very much by way of communicating. So with the emphasis on openness, what, what I'm telling people in relationships, couples and other relationships is never mind about trying to figure out why the other person's feeling, behaving the way they are. Maybe don't even try so hard to figure out why you're feeling the way you are. Just tune in to what you are actually feeling. And in particular, are you open or closed right now? Because if either person in a conversation is too closed, the conversation is simply not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And if people persist as if there's a conversation happening, they're likely to either frustrate each other or injure each other. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you notice that really you or the other person are too closed down to actually make contact, to actually hear each other, to actually express yourself well, you need to take a time out and figure out how you can help each other be open. In other words, you sort of momentarily put the content on pause. You stop talking about what you're going to do for Christmas vacation. And instead, you turn to the other person and say, you know, it doesn't feel like we're that open to each other right now. Let's figure out how we can be more open so that we can really talk about this. And so you talk about how can we help each other be open. And notice I'm emphasizing how can you help each other be open because the biggest trigger for closing down in a, an important relationship is that you notice that the other person was closing down. So turn that around, the, the, the strongest tool we have to help the other person be open so that we can be heard and understood in the way we want to be is to help the other person stay open. Mm -hmm. And our biggest tool for doing that is our own openness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In other words, often, and people may be able to resonate with this, often you notice that the other person's closing down. But when you talk to them about what just happened, I thought I had you with me, but then you kind of shut down. The other person might say, well, yeah, you, you once again said that I'm just like my mother. Mm -hmm. now, if you were coming from a very open place, you might not have said, well, you're just like your mother. And you might, especially might not have said it in that impatient way that caused your partner to close down. So often we don't notice that we've started to close down. Often the first clue we have that we've started to close down is that the other person's closing down. We resonate with each other. Our nervous systems are built very well to take in the states of other people and the closer we are to the other person, the more we take that in. And to resonate, meaning to kind of follow suit. So my openness helps you to be a little bit more open. As we're having this conversation, I'm noticing that you're very interested in what I'm saying. You're looking at me, you've been making a few notes. So I'm thinking, oh, she, she wants to have this conversation with me. That helps me relax and say what I need to say, to listen to you when you speak. And so we help each other do that. Hmm. So um, going back, um, aperture. So you talked about aperture as how opened or closed we are, and that's a central a centerpiece of your work. Okay. So it's how open or closed you are to receiving the information as it's being um, delivered, or how open or closed is your presence, or how open or closed is your heart, or are they all the same? Um, yeah, the best uh, approximation for a detail of what I'm talking about is think of it as emotional openness, emotional aperture. Um, we, but, but what I emphasize to people is you can't, aperture is, is a felt sensation. Aperture is not something you figure out. In other words, if I try to think about, am I open to you right now? I won't really get the answer that's important. What I need to do is just ask myself the simplest possible question, open or closed. Do I feel open right now to having this conversation or not? Is my sense that CJ is open right now to having this conversation? It doesn't involve figuring out, well, why would CJ want to have this conversation? Why is she open or not to this conversation? It's simply, we have a sensation of it. It's much like our vision. Think of the way we see. When we see something, 
we don't analyze all of the photons that are coming into our retina. We don't analyze the colors in the picture or the scene that we're looking at. We kind of instantly see, oh, over there's the tree, over there's the farmhouse. Um, it, aperture is like that. It's not something that we figure out. It's a sensation like sight or hearing or taste. All of these are things that involve a, a vast amount of input that our brain is processing so well and so automatically that we're not consciously involved in the processing. It simply kind of happens. Like we're out in the world, our hearing for most of us just kind of happens. Our vision kind of happens. Aperture sensation is like that. The problem is that mostly we don't pay attention to it. These other senses, we kind of know what they can do for us. Mm. What I found as I started working with people around Aperture, what I found is it's not that we don't know how to sense it. It's that mostly we don't pay attention to that sensation because we don't know what it can do for us. Mm. So help so, us help people who are thinking, okay, I want to do this, but I don't know if I'm open or not and I don't know how to feel it with my senses can you walk us through an exercise so we can get a sense of what it feels like we can kind of tune in and go oh I see what you're saying yeah so for some the, the starting place of that is just to ask yourself do you feel open or not right now and sometimes it might be in a conversation with another person or sometimes it might be you're taking a walk I just took a hike this afternoon and I love hiking so almost as soon as I put my feet on the trail I get a I get a strong sense of openness I love being in the trees I love being out in the fresh air that's openness to me on the other hand um, let's say, um i'm on the way to the grocery store to get food for for the night i get to the grocery store and realize the parking lot is jammed people are streaming into the shopping um center you know it's too crowded it's too much trouble now i'm starting to close down i don't like this situation it doesn't feel good so we close or open not just to other people but to our environment in general mm. and the starting place is learning to pay attention to that, but stepping back from why am I open or closed just to do I feel open or closed. For some people for whom this doesn't, for, I would say for about half the people that hear me say this, it's automatic. They go, oh yeah, of course, I know what she's talking about. And this is captured in our language a lot of times. You know, the a couple of phrases we use these days, we talk about, you had me at hello right? Mm -hmm. That's a phrase that means I was quickly open to you. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what it's telling us. It doesn't say why you had me at hello. It just, I'm, I'm, I'm really open to you. Or the other phrase we might say, some of people say, I'm just not buying what you're saying. Mm -hmm. It means is I'm closing down to what you're saying. I'm, it, I don't trust it. I don't believe you. Something like that. But basically, it's, it's an indication that I'm closing. Yeah. The people for whom this might be a little bit more of a stretch, and for some people it, it may be, um, the, this, a starting place might be to start to turn into, tune into what some of the physical sensations of open or closed are. So generally, we have certain experiences in our body that we know are kind of what happens to us if we get close. Some people might get a headache if they, if they are closed down too much. They might get a headache. They might get some tension in their jaw. Or a lot of people feel tension, tightness, coldness in their, in their core, in their chest, or in their belly. So some people have a sense of gripping in their belly. All of those sensations are sensations that I'm, I'm wary, I'm tense, I'm nervous, I'm not open. Yeah, it's almost open. fight or flight. They relate a lot to me to fight or flight. It's your fear response, exactly. We're, that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And when you're not in fear response, the sensation you have is of softness, openness, warmth, relaxed. I feel nice and easy. So a good starting place is to kind of review what do you know already about your ways of knowing open or closed. Mm -hmm. And then start to tune into that in the simplest possible way when you're talking to other people, especially if you're in a hard conversation. Notice the point at which you start to feel like the other person isn't listening or you don't want to listen because you don't like what they're saying. Those are the moments when you notice yourself closing down. Mm. You might notice 
when the other person kind of gets your joke or laughs a little bit, you might notice a good feeling that you you open up a little bit more. Mm, and so when, and, and I've been actually, after taking your class, my husband and I had the joy of taking your class and we practiced some of these things. And it was interesting because uh, I, I had had people kind of tune in anyways during during meetings of like, are they open or closed? And one of the things that one of the gentlemen I was coaching said, um, this is somewhat related, but I, th- I think it is related is he said, um, sometimes I'm in meetings, this is a, in a high tech group and, every, and they're super complicated topics and people get easily confused, right? With these very academic and technical com- um, ideas. And he said that um, I feel the tension in the room Mm -hmm. and I feel confused. And Mm -hmm. I said, well, you're the canary in the coal mine because you're probably feeling something that everyone is feeling, but you're feeling it sooner rather than other people. And he said, I think so. And I said, what would happen if you just named it? Like, I just am feeling a little bit confused in the meeting. And he started doing that. And he said, there was this palpable, like, (sighs) Like the minute he said, I'm confused, everyone could just like, oh my gosh, that's what I was, they didn't know what quite the word was, but they were feeling something in the room and him just stating, it's sort of a version of open close, right? He was saying, I'm closed because I'm confused. He labeled it in his own word, but words, but things just kind of simmer down. Yes. When he was able to just name that he was not, I think in your parents will say he was not open. Yes. Because he's, I'm just confused and shut down. But he said it made such a huge difference in the meeting um, when he did that. And unfortunately, my husband and I, I don't think we um, have it down yet. So maybe you can give us some tips. So we, we thought, okay, this is really good. I think and both of us do a ton of meditation and we know when we're open and we know when we're closed. And um, we would start a conversation and almost knowing that you're going to have a challenging conversation, you know, if you were open, you're a little bit less open when it comes like, oh, God, I want to talk to you about, uh, oh, oh, you know, like everything just starts closing down. And so um, I had, I can't even remember, we tried this right after we took that wonderful class with you during the weekend. And um I said, I don't feel like, and I think this is the thing. I was like, I don't feel like we're open. And I was like, I don't feel like you're open. And he's like, nah, don't tell me I'm not open. I hate when you did. And then it ended up being kind of like, okay, let's not use this model anymore. But if we were to go back to tempting this model again, I assume I actually was reading some of the notes that we had. And it's like, I need to, I think if the thing that I just heard you say is, perhaps the fact that he was feeling close was because I was closing and he was, re- you know, even the words, I want to talk to you about something was kind of yes. closing yes. and then he closed. And so even using the words, I'm now realizing saying like, we're, I feel like we're not open. We're not open. Yes, exactly. Was that, well, would that have been a better choice? <laughs> yes, totally. You figured it out. That's great. That's exactly <laughs> Right. That's exactly right. You figured out two things. First of all, the scariest words in the human language are, honey, we have to talk. Yeah. Oh, no. (laughs) What is it? And secondly, yes, when you sense closing down, first of all, it's likely that you are closed. It's not just the other person, but it, it doesn't work so well to tell the other person they're closed. It works a lot better to simply say, it feels like we're not that open right now. Let's talk about that before we get started with the conversation. Let's think. And, you know, what you were noticing is, yes, lots of conversations, you, you each already know that it's going to be pretty tricky. So how do you get open if if immediately upon thinking of that topic, you start to close down? And what that means is maybe before talking about that topic, you need to spend some time with each other just talking about how can we help each other stay open? Given that we know this is a tricky conversation, what do you need in order to be a little bit more open to me? What do I need in order to be a little bit more open to you? Now let's try that. And then even just the, the... Focusing on the fact that you're going to try to stay open rather than focusing on getting your point across and making sure the other person knows that you're right is a different focus. It it says we're going to work together for this thing about openness, which is a different goal than exchange of ideas. 
Mm. I would suggest it's a more relational goal. And what it says is, and this gets to something else that I often tell people, the most important outcome of any conversation you, any important conversation you have with somebody you care about is going to be how you each end up feeling about the relationship when the conversation is over. I think that it's funny because a common theme that I'm finding in both my work and of course in this conversation, because it all kind of cir comes circling back is the task and relationship, right. right? When you have, and it's, and it can also be female, male, and it's something that I've been wrestling with lately. How do you both make your point, you know, right. take out the garbage, you know, <laughs> then like let's open to each other to have a, yet another conversation of taking out the guard, you know, whatever it is, but it's really, it's always really hard to know which of these two things would it be just simpler say like, can you just please take out the garbage, you know, or let's open and let's talk and then please, please take out the garbage. What even the relationship is a task oriented thing. So what is a better, and this is something that I'm, I'm literally facing with my coaching lately. I, I don't really know, like, how does one balance these things in an artful way so that the task isn't the relationship, something, yeah. you know, there, it feels too, okay, now that we're open, I need to tell you something, you know, how do you, how do you move to a more, I don't know, a more elegant solution? Well, I think part of what you're talking about is, is that there are usually two things going in the conversation. There's the task, which is usually the thing that you need to talk about or problem solve about, et cetera. And then there is the relationship and both of those things are happening simultaneously. Notice already how complicated that feels. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, the reason you're asking me this question is, my goodness, that feels so complicated, like what to pay attention to. And this is the reason I started telling people, pay attention to openness. And here's how that goes. The best thing you can do to, to help people communicate about the task, about the subject matter, to do the problem solving, they will do their very best problem solving when they're in a state of openness. You talked earlier that the state of closeness is really a state of fear. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly right. We have this fight, fright, fight, flight, freeze response. That's our, that's our amygdala setting off the alarm, danger, danger, danger. And as soon as we're in a danger, danger, danger response, we don't function very well. We can't yeah. speak very well. We can't listen very well. And we certainly don't problem solve very well. Mm -hmm. uh, your person that was in the room saying, boy, I just feel so confused. That's because he, yes, he was closed down and he was in a fear response and our brains literally stop working. They, they've studied, one of the ways we have a study in the brain with the fMRIs, we study blood flow to various regions of the brain. And what they found is that when people are afraid, the blood flow to the prefrontal and, and frontal cortex, where we do our problem solving, decreases. And so we sometimes when people get too closed down, they'll notice kind of this fog brain or what he was noticing. Gee, it just all feels too confusing. It's just too much. That's his fear response. So the best shot you have, whether it's in a committee meeting and you're trying to do problem solving about whether or not to take this new client or whether it's with your, your spouse and you're trying to figure out who should take out the garbage, the best shot you have, you have in the world of problem solving or communicating at all is the openness. And that happens to be also what you need to do in order to have the end of the conversation come and you feel good about each other and yourself. Mm. So really, it all hinges around that. And once you get open, then you don't stay forever talking about how nice and open you are. You go back to the to the topic, right? And now let's talk about the garbage. Okay, so <laughs> so so I wanted to the other thing. Maybe, that maybe you even go back to it with some humor because yeah. now both of you are a little bit more relaxed, and so you realize actually, you know, garbage is not the most serious thing in the world. It just happens to be something we need to talk about, right? Um, the other thing that you talked about that I shared with some of my coaching clients that I really liked is slowing down, um, the slowing down exercise. So I was wondering yeah. if you can share that idea, the concept and where it came from and why it works so well. 
Yeah, yeah, let me talk about that. Because I do think that maybe the single most important thing for people to do as they're trying to learn this and to help each other be open and help each other notice when they're not open is to slow things down. The rate at which we conduct conversation usually is way too fast to even process the content. How many times have you been in a conversation where you, you think you know what just was said, but you're not sure, but you're going to answer anyway, right? Let, let's just go with that, right? Yes. And then the other person, three more paragraphs later says, actually, that wasn't what I was talking about, right? So we, can, we can't even really talk process the content very well and we certainly in the rapidity with which we usually talk to each other we can't process things like open or close things like do I feel good about having this conversation right now how do I feel how does the other person feel about this how can we come to a fair agreement none of that gets processed properly if you're going too fast so the mo single most important thing to do is slow it down and some people will, will notice that they get a little uncomfortable slowing it down. We're not actually that comfortable with silences. The exercise that I use for, with people is a rather extreme form of slowing it down. But I do find that even the first time people try this, they find it helps them a lot to stay open and also to not get confused, to not get lost, to have new responses. Because after all, if we're having the same old responses we had the last time we talked about this difficult thing, what's the point in that? So the slowing down exercise goes like this. Each time one of you speaks, you speak for only one to two sentences. And then you pause before the next person speaks for about that same amount of time, about the length of time of one to two sentences. In other words, one to two sentences and then a fairly chunky silence. Yeah, let's demonstrate so people know what we're talking about. So let's, um, um, I'm going to just say two sentences and then uh, we'll see what happens. I think that's a good idea. I like the idea that we could demonstrate this. I do too. <laughs> okay, so, so I was repeating, I like the idea that we can demonstrate this. And I was waiting to like repeat. And then I was like, I do too. And it feels, you know, my husband and I did this and it feels really unnatural because it's not our normal cadence of things. Um, and, and, I, and I wonder if it's, dependent upon a person's personality. So for example, I had talked to, um, again, in a corporate setting, there's extroverts and introverts. And one of the big things in corporations right now is to make sure that everyone is collaborating in, in participating in the meeting. And generally what happens is they're talkers in the meetings and they're people who just sit and shut down. And this mm -hmm. is just what happens. And then the talkers are like, why isn't anyone saying anything? Yeah. And, and then the person who's on this side is like, because you never stop talking. <laughs> uh huh. Right. Is this an outcome? Is this also a way to navigate introverts and extroverts? Um, is yeah. that also part of the benefit of doing this? Yes, exactly. Because people that now you're getting at a, a, a different element. There's slowing things down, and there's also achieving a certain balance. It just so happens that in conversation with among people, two people or more people, um, the best conversation happens when everybody's talking. And if it's two people, you should each be talking about 50% of the time. Now that doesn't have to be exact. You don't have to do a word count, but what it means is in most relationships, there is one person that does more of the talking than the other person. So if you try to balance it at 50-50, the person that doesn't speak so much is going to have to talk quite a bit for them. And the other person is going to have to listen a lot more than they usually do. And so right away, you've achieved a certain balance. The reason this is important is because a good conversation is actually a process of thinking together. And the old saw of two heads are better than one. Yes, indeed. And why would you waste part of that in any conversation, whether it's about understanding what's going on or problem solving, you want the benefit of all, all you've got, got on board, everything that both of you can get in touch with, produce, explicate for each other. 
And so you want to make sure that everybody's talking. In a group, it's not going to be 50-50. It's going to be divided more ways. But basically, you want to make sure that, that there are people that are silenced and that there are people that are talking all the time. And some of it's just um, in, um, inviting a group or asking a group at the beginning of a group process to achieve balance. You know, mm -hmm. just be aware that some of you are very comfortable speaking up in these meetings and others of you have a, take a little bit more time to find what you want to say. So we're all going to work together to make sure that we have the benefit of everybody that's here at the table speaking and so then the talk the talkers know that they have to kind of help the other people speak sometimes as simply as by just not talking so much and the people that don't speak so much know that they are being very explicitly invited not to just sit back and give up that the group is going to make sure everybody gets heard from and it, mm. it is makes for a very different group conversation. I want to go back to also the unnaturalness, unnaturalness that you talked about, about the slowing it down. You know, when I give exercises like that to people, I emphasize this is an experiment. It's not, yes, it will feel unnatural. It's, it's not meant to be, oh, this is the way you should always talk to each other all the time. It is meant to be an experiment with talking this way for two reasons. One, so that you can discover how much more is possible if you slow things down a little bit. And two, so that you get the hang of it and get over the awkwardness of slowing things down so that when you need to slow things down, let's say the conversation suddenly gets harder and that's a good time to slow it down. You kind of remember, oh yeah, let's try slowing it down. So your practice, this is like the, when you're learning to play the piano and you do your scales, people keep doing the scales even after they know how to play the piano, but they don't just play scales. They play the scales to warm up, to kind of refresh themselves about what it feels like to be at the keyboard. So these kinds of exercises are like the scales I give people mm. to kind of get proficient in certain things like slowing it down or like achieving balance. So that when they're in the middle of a really difficult conversation, they kind of know some things to try. Mm. You know, I one of the things that I found incredibly beneficial about slowing down because it's not my I literally have people say slow down slow down because my my previous speech pattern was so fast that it was just because my brain is I'm a visual person I'm thinking about a thousand things like blah, 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 you know and if I get excited it's like oh god help us you know it's, it's, it's a disaster and my um my son needs me to slow down. And I think also there are people who have learning disabilities who have ADHD. So your 500 sentences, he'll, he'll often say, can you just distill it down to two? Sounds <laughs> like really, these are the two things that you wanted to say. Right, yes. Could you have just like thought a little bit before that came pouring yep. out of your mouth. And so he's trained me. <laughs> To right. talk in a different way, I just think, okay, I only have, if I really want him to listen, uh -huh. I have to nail this in two sentences, two sentences. So I think about what I'm going to say and I'm, I'm thinking, right. <laughs> and then I say it and he said, do you realize that's how I talk all the time? Uh -huh. I thought, oh, that's interesting because he's an introvert. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. he's thinking very carefully about the precise exact things that convey his meaning Whereas an extrovert, I, I figure out what I want by talking out loud. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it's, right. Yeah. Some people, some people figure out what they're thinking by talking, and some people need silence to figure out what they're thinking. And so, you in most conversations, you're going to have one of each or several of each. And so that's the reason for slowing it down is because the person that doesn't figure it out by talking needs the silence to know what they're going to say. And if we mistake the silence for the fact that the person has nothing to say, we make a big mistake. Mm, yeah, that's a really good point. The other thing that I was thinking about is that two different styles of shutting down. I'm, I'm going back to the aperture because there's <laughs> either, you know, when, when you're in an, in an argument or about like a confrontational, there's either... The passive, I'm just shutting down, like whatever. Right. Or the kind of like, and here's another thing, and this kind of aggressive, and your mom does the same thing. And so right. there's these two different kind of styles, one that's more passive and checked yeah. out and more aggressive. Yeah. And what I'm hearing is neither is 
particularly helpful because you're not open. Um, yeah. But can you talk a little bit more about those two different styles and, and how some of this stuff, I, I'm getting a sense that if you're passive, um, you need more time to, it may relate to some of the other things that we talk, you're more kind of digesting and you're kind of checking things out, or if you're aggressive, you want to be heard and understood. How do those things, converse, those two topics, the slowing down and aperture, or are they related? How is aperture related to the aggressive? Either passive, kind of passive, like, okay, whatever. I'm just going to check out. Um, you're talking about your the garbage right. again. Right, right. Or your mom always had a problem with the garbage too. You know, whatever it is, it's more, one's more aggressive and one's more passive. Well, one of the things that's interesting about, about a conversation where those two styles are the typical styles of the two people is that actually they accentuate each other. The more the talker talks, the more the person that's shutting down and being silent gets silent. The mm. more the person that's very often people talk, the, I, what I watch is I watch some people will say something and their partner doesn't respond. And instead of waiting that extra beat, for the partner to figure out what they want to say and say it, the talker keeps talking. And, and what I see is often when people say something, especially to, let's say, their, their partner, they can be very nervous about how is this going to be received. Like, I want to talk to you about why you're not taking the garbage out. That, that's not only hard for the person that's hearing it to hear, it's hard for the person saying it usually to say because you feel like, oh, this isn't gonna go well, right? And so the talking style, and I actually prefer the talking style and the listening style because we have a little bit of a load on the words passive and aggressive and they sound like they're kind of, each of them kind of bad things. And so actually let's talk about talking and not talking and talking and listening. The person is talking and saying this thing, it's making them nervous. A talker will tend to keep talking as they get nervous. But what they really need in order to deal with the nervousness is what they really need to know is, how are you feeling about what I just said? Because if you're feeling terrible about it, maybe I want to table this conversation for the rest of the night. Or if you're feeling open to it, okay, that's good. So what we need to realize is if we're nervous, especially us talkers, and probably you and I are both a bit that way, what we need to realize is we say something and we're not sure how it's going to be received. That's exactly the moment that we need to either just wait to let the other person say how it's being received or even prompt them by saying, you know, I, I really have to talk about how to take the garbage out. And how do you feel about talking about that right now? So you punctuate with the explicit question that says, I really want to know how you feel about what I just said. And often you can just say that. It's okay to say the simple, obvious thing. I really need to know how you feel about what I just said. Mm -hmm. And then you stop and you wait, knowing that the fact that they don't respond right away doesn't mean they don't have anything to say. It means they need some time. Mm -hmm. Some people take a longer time, the listeners, the maybe the introverts take a longer time to find what it is they want to say and put it into words. And as you suggested, they construct their language a little bit more carefully after they've had a chance to think about it. Mm -hmm. And so the talkers really need to just sit back and, you know, use, use the moment to think about how open am I? And am I the right amount of open for this conversation? And what do I perceive about the other? You know, use the time for a little musing about what's going on, mm. you know, at the moment with, with your conversation and stay ready to receive when the other person says, okay, here's how I feel about what you just said. And how about if you're a listener? Is there anything that you can do so that the talker, because it sounds like it, there's two sides of the equation. So if you're a listener and you're, like, yes, that's, what, a great, that's a great question, CJ. I'm glad you thought to ask that. The listener needs to ask for time. Give me a second to answer that or something exactly. like that. It's, in other words, we all, our culture, as, as we all know, is biased towards the extrovert. It's biased mm. towards talking. We think of a good contribution in a conversation as what did we say? 
or what did the other person say? But half of the time, somebody's got to be listening, right? And so the listening is a contribution, but we don't think of it that way. Therefore, not only do the talkers need to invite participation and then be quiet, but the person that needs the time needs to get to the place of normalizing the fact that that's what's needed and speaking up for it. And one of the ways that people can do that is to realize what you're speaking up for is having a good conversation. And what you know is that it's not actually gonna be a very good conversation if you go down the usual path of the other person doing all the talking and you're doing all the listening. That's not gonna be a great conversation. And so on behalf of the relationship and on behalf of having a great conversation, you say maybe even at the beginning until both of you kind of get the hang of it, you might say, you know, this will go a lot better for me if we just kind of slow it down and if you pause more often and give me some time to think. I'm going to need some time to think about what you're saying and I do have things I want to say, but they'll get lost if I feel too much pressure. Mm -hmm. And then maybe during the conversation, you repeat that, like the person looks like they're about to go into their second paragraph. And you might just say, hang on a second. I need to, I need to think about what you just said. And I need some time to do that. And I also might want to want to say something about that. So could you give me a minute? Mm -hmm. so could you give me a minute? It's just a really simple way of saying, I need a minute to process this. Let's, you know, give me, can you give me that? And very rarely will the other person say, no, I can't give you a minute. If they do, then you might want to take a big time out. But usually they'll say, but we just need reminding, especially the talkers can kind of, you know, just get on a roll and they need a little reminder. Wait a second. You have some good ideas, the talker, but so does the other person. They just don't offer them in the same way that you do. Make space for that. And, and it, it can be that simple. And again, it's something that you get better with it, with practice. It's very interesting. One of the things that I see, I know this isn't the context, but it is very related in, in, in corporate world where there's a lot of like collaboration that's needed. And, and now a marker on if you're collaborating, that's good. If you're right. not collaborating, that's bad. Right. And collaborating means extroverted talking. It's yeah. not listening. And it's weird because someone's like, I'm listening. Isn't uh -huh. that collaborating? Because if everyone's talking, who's yeah. listening? <laughs> and I, I, I thought a lot about that. It's interesting because we don't think about the art of listening and how important it is for good collaboration. Because if everyone's talking, yes. no one's listening. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really even know how to, I, I thought about that a lot going, well, I just, that is such a true thing. And so how could good collaboration be also listening? on both parts, but it's almost as if we miss that it's, yes, you have to listen. And also we want to hear you because otherwise it's not a good conversation and not, we're not thinking together. That's what I got from today's conversation. Like, ah, I get it. Cause this, that's what I would say to the person who said, well, I'm listening. So I am collaborating. Yes, but you're not exactly. talking and listening. It's not just listening as if you're a, a court reporter. You're not just listening to take notes and write it into the minutes. If you are, then you're, I don't know, the, the group secretary, and that's a whole role in itself. But that's not what the listening is. The listening isn't about just listening. It's listening so that you can think together, so that you can work with what you just heard, and not just so that you can repeat it back if somebody says, could you tell us what was just said? That's <laughs> not what we're looking for. We're looking for everybody in the room to be both listening and speaking and to be working with the ideas synthetically so that what you come out with at the end of the conversation is something brand new that nobody brought to the table. Mm. And a good dialogue is not just a drag and drop where people tell you what they already knew and you pick who's got the best answer a good dialogue is a conversation where people start with what they already know and then go on from there to figure things out together in real time as they're having the conversation and here's the wonderful thing about once you start eliciting this kind of dialogue that you're talking about because i've had my clients go i've tracked them over like six six weeks over 12 weeks rather six sessions over 12 weeks and and what they say is that it's it's a virtuous cycle because then they talk more and people are, thank God you're talking. <laughs> they're right. so happy right. that right. they're talking and people listen and then they think, 
actually people do care about what I'm saying and they're yeah. listening. And yeah. so then it just becomes this whole virtuous circle. So people yeah. ask them more to participate. They feel more comfortable participating, but it, there's almost like it's a jump rope and you have to be able to run yeah. into the, and start jumping. And yeah. once you jump, you're like, this is fun. But until <laughs> then they're just on the side, like, I'm not going to jump in there. Like that just seems crazy. I might get hit by the rope, but right. once they jump in, it ends up being quite enjoyable for them. I mean, yeah. that's the good news, but it's the courage to jump in, which sometimes is kind of scary, particularly in competitive tech environments where everybody has to get their IP and idea in. Right. Um, so, which I think is correlate to all this stuff, whether it's couple connection or just human to human connection in groups or one-on-one, -on -one, all of these people. And, and I also, what one of the persons I was co coaching was talking about having problems with this girlfriend who was very volatile and she'd get volatile. Right. And then he would shut down. Right. And, and then I said, okay, try slowing things down. And he did that. And he was so excited. He got back and he said, this really worked. Oh my God. I feel like I had the magic elixir when I had this. So, right. um, so yeah. So, so it's just, I wanted to report back to you because I am sharing the stuff that um, we, I learned during your workshop. And if folks want to read the book, it's called the art of opening in the moment couples connection simplified. We've been talking to Catherine Ford. Thank you so much for sharing your work with me. You're welcome. Let me just make one correction. That book is in the process of being published, so they won't be able to find the book. Okay. But they will be able to find me by either, I do a lot of teaching with Stanford Continuing Studies, which is where you took the course. So by going to Stanford Continuing Studies, you can find what I'm teaching. My next teaching, um, my next course will be end of January, January 22nd and 29th. And the signups are open already, so they can sign up for that. And, and then other than that, they can go to my website, which is katherinefordmd.com, and they can find my stuff. And yes, soon they will be able to go and find the book, but not Hooray. just... I was, so they, when, when is it coming out? So people know that they maybe can, can they add it on Amazon now for their Christmas list for their loved ones? I don't think that's possible, but, but I'm getting there very soon and tell them they can go to my website to see when that's going to be possible. And then they can do that. Excellent. Thank you so much.